is eternally outside the range of your ability to conceptualize. And that's a problem for us, isn't it? Because what you can conceptualize will be under your control, right? But Krishna always demonstrates he's totally free from your control. The only one who has independence in the full sense is Krishna. Therefore, Lord Brahma says, Ishwar Parama Krishna, Satchitananda Vigraha, Anadya Adya Govinda, Sarvakarna Karna. There's one controller, that is Krishna. And his body is the same as himself. His body is composed of eternity, full knowledge, and unceasing bliss. He has no beginning, yet he is the beginning for everything else. So that is the testimony of Lord Brahma. <clears throat> Still, there are persons who are theistic and they, according to their limited consciousness, have very limited conceptions of what is the Supreme, what is God. They may consider that God is all-pervading, the all-pervading spirit. Because they cannot dare to consider that there could be a person who is unlimited. Just think about that. How can there be a person who is unlimited? According to ordinary men mental concoction or conceptualization, personhood means limitation. Personhood means finiteness. If the Supreme is infinite, if the Supreme is unlimited, ananta, how can the Supreme be a personality? This is our concoction, our speculation. And you probably know many persons who succumb. They fall victim to this speculation. Not Lord Brahma, though. Lord Brahma states, Govindamadi Purusham Tambaham Majami. I'm worshipping that original person who has no cause, yet that person is the cause of all the causes. Govindamadi Purusham Tamaham Pajami. Or you may imagine that there are so many gods competing with one another. Although this is nowhere stated in the Vedic knowledge. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains clearly Mata Pratulam Nanya Kinchidasti Dananjaya. Oh, Arjuna, Dananjaya. There is no one or anything superior to me. Everything rests upon me as pearls are strung on a thread. When Krishna says, no one superior to me, that means no demigods, not even Krishna's Vishnu expansion, not even Lord Narayan. No, nothing superior to Krishna means nothing. So persons who think that there are many gods, and you can just appease the one that seems to benefit you at the present moment. They have, they have calculated it's good to have a broad coverage insurance policy. <laughs> you don't know which one is the ultimate, so therefore you offer some puja to each one. You have all the pictures on your altar, and therefore you may luck out by having the right one on the altar. It's called broad coverage insurance policy. <laughs> Then there are those who recognize that God, the Supreme, is the Creator. And they feel a natural sense of obligation towards that Creator. Gratitude and uh, indebtedness. Others visualize God as the Supreme Punisher. He will smash you. It will destroy you. Let us consider. There are four types of persons who approach the science of the Supreme. Let us see what category you are in, or maybe what category you used to be in before acquiring knowledge of Bhagavad Gita. The first category is Bhaya, fear. In the Christian Bible, it is stated, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That is true. But it's not the end of wisdom. 
But we have to begin somewhere. Just like you teach your children to fear when they cross the street. But similarly, it is a very rudimentary level of God realization to fear the power of God, the punishing ability of God, to fear the power of material nature, which is controlled by God. So that fearful approach to theism, that fearful approach to conceptualizing what is God, is quite common. You should behave yourself or God will smash you. <laughs> Parents can raise their children that way. I may not see the sins you're doing, but God sees and he'll get you. <laughs> so that is the Baya approach, the fear approach to God. And then there's the Asha approach. You're approaching God to pin on Him your material desires for success and material happiness. You've got big hopes, Asha, big dreams. And implicit in this approach to the Supreme is that you expect your hopes and dreams to be fulfilled. This kind of approach to the Supreme is actually born out of greed. I recognize that on my own endeavors, with my own endeavors, I can't get everything I want. So because my greed is such that I want more and more, I want more material happiness, more material opulence, then I approach God. So on the one hand, it is innocent. Naturally, you turn to superior power to get what you want. On the other hand, it's also a sign of greed. Then, there is the approach to the Supreme based on duty. Kartavya Bhuti, Shila Bhakti Thakur calls it. That because I am his part, I have an obligation to him. I must act in a certain way because I am his part. As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Mamayam show jiva loke, jiva bhuta sanatana. You living entities are eternally my fragmented parts. Certainly, you are my fragmented parts. But you're stuck in the oppressive material atmosphere, and you're struggling with your six senses, including the mind. So in the Kartavya Bhuti stage, Shilabhakti Vinod Thakur describes, you feel an, a duty, just like a good family member feels duty to the parents. I am part of this family, so I should act according to my obligations. I should commit myself to fulfilling my debts, executing my duties. This is not the end of Dharma, however. This is not the end of spiritual approaches. That's why in the closing verses of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna instructs Arjuna, Sarva Dharma Prajaja, Mam Ekam Shadanamaja. Abandon all varieties of conceptions of what you think is Dharma, Arjuna, and just leave everything up to me. That means do what I say. Shut down your plan-making factory, accept my plan. Rid yourself of your conceptions and accept my giving you knowledge of who I am. That is the advantage of Bhagavad Gita. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is not hiding. He is speaking to you, informing you of what he is, what he likes, how to attain him. So the last stage or the highest stage of approaching God is called Raga, spontaneous attraction. This is not achieved immediately. The best and recommended way for devotees to begin is on the platform of Kartavya Bhuti, duty, commitment. And then, gradually, that natural attraction for Krishna which has been hidden lifetime after lifetime, 
starts to reveal itself. Just like you have a match. There's no fire happening when you have a match, but if you strike the match, the fire reveals itself. So similarly, if you follow the process of sadhana bhakti, the rules and regulations of devotional service, the natural attraction for Krishna will ignite. Natural attraction, raga means it just happens. There's no uh, extraneous endeavor needed to make that attraction flow. Queen Kunti Devi in the first canto, Srimad Bhagavatam gives the example. Gange Bhoga Just like the Ganga flows incessantly toward the ocean, similarly, may my attraction flow constantly toward you, Krishna. Rupa Goswami gives another example of Raga. Attraction for Krishna that it's just there. You don't have to conjure it up. You don't have to manufacture it. It happens. Rupa Goswami prays. I know that young boys are attracted to young girls. And young girls are attracted to young boys. I'm simply praying to you, Krishna, that my mind will be attracted to you in the same spontaneous way. Wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> so Rupa Goswami is using the example of what goes on in material nature. Srila Prabhupada would explain, no boy or girl has to be taught to be attracted to the opposite sex. When the age is right, it happens. None of you went to school to learn that. Simply, simply when you were a teenager, young teenager, suddenly the opposite sex started to look different. That is spontaneous attraction. You don't need lessons. You don't have to make any kind of endeavor. It's just there. So Rupa Goswami says, let me be attracted to Krishna like that. That is Raga. The ultimate place for spontaneous love of Krishna is Goloka Vrindavan. Krishna has his pastimes. Once every day of Brahma, he comes to the material world and displays his Vrindavan pastimes. But those Vrindavan pastimes are also going on eternally in the highest planet of the spiritual world. There's very little difference between Krishna's pastimes when he comes to this world and Krishna's pastimes in the topmost portion of the spiritual world. Very little difference. There's some difference. Krishna is visible to ordinary vision only once in a day of Brahma. Whereas in Goloka Vrindavan, the topmost portion of the spiritual world, Krishna is always visible to those who have the qualification. And of course, to be in the spiritual world, you have to have qualification. But when he comes to the material world, once every day of Brahma, once every 24 hours of Brahma, that means once every 8,640,000,000 years, everyone can see him, but very few understand who he is, although they're seeing him. Still, they're seeing him. Most think he's the most powerful human being on the planet. Some think he's a demigod. Some think he's Vishnu or the Super Soul. Very few understand that he is Swayam Bhagavan, the original Supreme Personality of God, the source of all living entities and also the source of all avatars and expansions. So that is one slight difference between Krishna appearing with his pastimes, his lila in the material world and Krishna's eternal presence in the Loka Vrindavan. You can successfully understand Krishna 
by hearing from Krishna. How it is that he appears in this world? What is his mission? And you may be surprised to find out that the real mission of Krishna is to generate loving affairs. His parts and parcels have forgotten what is the love supreme. They've forgotten what is bhakti and they are trying to love matter and material arrangements. So Krishna comes to show you his pastimes to attract you back to him, to attract you, to revive your raga, your natural attraction for him. People have many conceptions of what is the Supreme Absolute Truth. And we don't argue with them as long as they recognize the goal of real Dharma, the goal of real religion is pure love of God. This is stated in Bhagavatam, first canto. Savai pum sam koro dharma yato bhakti ratokshade. Ahoy tuki apratiyata yanatma suprasidati. That religion, that spiritual process is first class when there is pure love of the Supreme. Ahoy tuki apratiyata. That means no material motivation. The Sanskrit hetu means cause, motive. That means you're not approaching Krishna simply because of fear or because you have material hopes and dreams. You want protection. No material motivation. And because there's no material motivation, there's no interruption in your loving affair. Ahoyintuki apratiyata. The Bhagavatam says, Yenatma suprasidati. That's the only way the Atma, the real self, will be satisfied with pure love. Pure love is the eternal function of the living entity. When the living entity is in the pure state, that means there is simply pure love. So in that way, we are not sectarian. Any spiritual endeavor that understands the ultimate goal of life is pure love of God. We accept. But then, just think. If you have an incomplete conception of what is God, how can your love be pure? How can there be freedom from material motivation. You may say, I am worshiping God because He is God. Or, I am worshiping God because I want this desire fulfilled, that desire fulfilled. Or you may say, I'm worshiping God because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of His power. I'm afraid of what will happen if I don't worship Him. <laughs> so these are all material motivations which are not pure even you can say our father who art in heaven give us the daily bread you're expressing gratitude because God is giving to you as long as the giving is going on everything is fine so all those are material motivations Vishnu is the maintainer. So you may say, I will worship Vishnu because he's maintaining me. That is nice, but it's not pure. You have a reason for worshiping Vishnu. Even Lord Narayan in Vaikuntha with unlimited opulence and majesty. You're worshiping Narayan because He's the support, the shelter of all living entities. And his Vaikuntha opulence is immeasurable. You know that he is Bhagavan. 
the source of unlimited opulence. You may approach God because he's the creator or because he's Bhagavan. But what is pure love? That you'll see in the topmost portion of the spiritual world. Where the residents of Goloka Vrindavan don't even care to know that Krishna is God. They are just unlimitedly attracted to Krishna for no other reason than Krishna is unlimitedly attracted. That is pure love. So therefore, we are non-sectarian. We say any religion that understands the goal is pure love of God, we accept. At the same time, however, we also know that only in the form of Krishna can there be pure love. Because even when you're worshiping Lord Narayana and Vaikuntha, you're attracted by the opulence, the majesty, the power. You know he's the supreme being. And so there's an attitude of awe and reverence. But Swaya Bhagavan, Shan Sundar, Krishna, Gopijana Balava, Govinda, Gopa. His devotees don't even care to think that Krishna is God. They just know he is the most attractive person, the most lovable person. That's all they know. Therefore, they can love purely because there's no external, extraneous motivation. They don't even think we're loving Krishna because he's God. No, they think we're loving Krishna because he's so unlimitedly attractive. How could anyone not love Krishna? That's what causeless means. There's no cause. There's no external or extraneous reason except the unlimited attractiveness of Krishna. Just like the Ganga flowing to the ocean. It does it. <laughs> so therefore, as we said, Queen Kunti is praying, may my attraction for Krishna be like that. This is a remote agricultural facility here. Who would ever think that the topmost portion of the spiritual world is a remote cowherd village in Vrindavan? <laughs> what is the wealth in Galoka Vrindavan? What are the riches? Fruit, twigs, <laughs> water, forest minerals, milk, that's it. Whereas in Vaikuntha, the opulence, the palatial opulence is inconceivable. But in the topmost portion of the spiritual world, Krishna's private abode, everything is so simple and the wealth is the pure love. So much so, the residents there are so wealthy in pure love, they don't even care that Krishna is God. They don't even think about it. An example commonly given, sometimes very rich and powerful persons, they just want to be treated like an ordinary person. Just like I heard that Bill Gates, when he was the richest man in the world, he would just want to be treated like a regular guy, and sometimes he would go out at night with disguise and just talk to people and try to have friends. Because otherwise, if he goes as Bill Gates, everyone is thinking, oh, I'll be his friend and I'll get some money and he'll do me a favor. So he would actually disguise himself and just go out and mingle with people to have genuine, normal relationships. <laughs> do you think the powerful world leaders, do you think they always want to be treated officially and uh, with it? all the decorum of their office that they hold? No. They have their own life behind closed doors. They have their intimate moments with family, with friends. You may remember some years ago, 
It was one politician. He became prime minister here in Australia. And it was right before the election, before he was, his party came to power and he was given the prime minister post. So it was a critical moment right before the election. And then there were newspaper headlines that he had been detected during a visit to New York, he had been detected as having visited a laptop dancing club. Remember that? <laughs> the newspapers, you know, were, oh, look at this, look at this. Uh, uh, he's a candidate for prime minister of his party wins. And what is he doing when he goes to New York all night at the laptop, la no, lap, I don't even know, lap dancing club. <laughs> <laughs> and what was his response? His response was such that he became even more popular. He said, what do you want out of me? I'm no holy joke, I'm just an ordinary guy. He was, yeah, yeah, there's our prime minister, that's what we want. <laughs> he admits he's just an ordinary guy like us. He said, yeah, I'm just an ordinary guy. I'm not a holy person, what do you want out of me? I did tell my wife that I acted like a bit of a goose that night. <laughs> I'm your, I'll be your prime minister? No, we're all the same, you know? <laughs> True story. <laughs> so, you see that even the most powerful persons, they want to have relationships that are not based on awe and reverence and power and majesty. Krishna, as the supreme enjoyer, knows exactly what the best enjoyment is. It's not being worshipped all the time. It's having intimate, personal, loving affairs with friends, with parents, with lovers. So that's what Krishna does in the topmost portion of the spiritual world. In that situation, it's possible to have pure love. Because you're not loving Krishna because he's God. You're not loving Krishna because of his opulence. You're just loving him because he is the unlimited sweetest person you'll ever find. So that is why we stress Krishna. We are not sectarian. If you can show that your religion leads to pure love of God, all right. But in order to have pure love of God, you have to understand something about the science of the Supreme that's beyond power and majesty and all kinds of reasons why you would worship. For Krishna, the ultimate reason in relationship with Krishna is simply that he's the unlimited sweetest person. There's nothing more to that. Not because he's God, because Simply, he's the sweetest and unlimitedly attractive person. So this is what predominates at the topmost planet of the spiritual world. Madhurya, sweetness, intimate sweetness is what predominates in the remote cowherd village known as Vrindavan. Where the wealth are twigs, fruits, milk, Krishna's Friends are cowherd boys. His girlfriends are cowherd girls. The forests of Vrindavan supply Krishna with natural pleasure. That's it. By our understanding, how to love purely, we can begin to understand why Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Mata Pratunandanya, Kinchirasti Tanandya, there's no one superior to me. As part of Krishna, our greatest necessity is to engage in pure loving relationship with Krishna. That's the greatest necessity. We cannot find an opportunity in the material world. The loving relationships in the material world always have a cause, right? Always a motivation, right? 
whether it's romantic relationship, a husband and wife, parent and child, friend and friend, there's always some material cause mixed in somewhere. Even in the most in a relationship that you would think is free of any kind of motivation, still there's something there. Even in the mother-child relationship, there's still something the mother wants, right? The mother's now. Generally speaking, a mother just serves her child night and day, just doing it because out of love for the child, desire to care for the child. That expression is there in parenting. A mother's job is never done. They worry about their children all their life. My mother is 85, she still worries about them. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? Why don't you ever come home? <laughs> She's 85 and she's still telling. I remember when you were just two months old, I used to hold you. <laughs> just never forget. <laughs> Still, although the mother-child relationship is the example, the greatest example you can find in the material world of something approaching pure love, it's not all the way there. Why? The mother wants a kickback, right? She wants... She wants gratitude, she wants uh, reciprocation. You know, mothers can be very demanding. And also, she may have some other kinds of material motivations. When my boy grows up, he's gonna be very famous and he'll bring our family fame, right? Or when he grows up, he'll make lots of money and he'll be able to provide for us in our old age. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I'm saying it's still, it's a material motivation. It is not selfless. So my point is that even in that most noble kind of relationship, that most self, selfless kind of relationship in the material, still there's a material motive. You want something back for yourself. You want to get back. It's like my mother, she wants attention. Why can't you tell me where you are in the world? <laughs> you spend all your time talking to these other people. What about your own mother? Because <laughs> she wants something. <laughs> of course, or as ordinarily known, that's all right. But we're looking at things through the lens of pure love. That means no motivation. You don't want any kickbacks. That's the nature of the topmost portion of the spiritual world. No one loves Krishna because they want something in return. They just love Krishna because Krishna is unlimitedly lovable. They all live for Krishna's happiness only. That is pure bhakti. In the topmost portion of the spiritual world, Krishna does not present himself as being all-powerful. Although that power is there, his prime presentation in Galoka Vrindavan is sweetness. The flavor is so sweet you cannot resist. So, his devotees are thinking. He may be God, he may not be God. It's Ill, that issue is irrelevant. He is the sweetest. <laughs> that is pure love. In this way, I hope you can understand that Krishna Bhakti is the pinnacle of existence. I hope by this brief survey of all the various conceptions that you can have, Krishna is always outside of your conceptions. He has his own lifestyle, his own modus operandi, 
outside of your material range of sense perception. If you can understand what is pure love of God, then you can actually understand why Krishna Bhakti is special and why Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, there's nothing superior to him. You see, if you simply consider God as master, that means there's distance between you and him. Like at work. If, no matter what kind of working situation you have at your job, teamwork or this or that, there's still some distance between you and the boss. <laughs> Just like in the military, they teach the soldiers, they, they teach the officers in the army, for example, you cannot fraternize with the ordinary persons in the army because it creates familiarity. There always has to be this gap, this distance between the officers and <laughs> the ordinary soldiers. So therefore the officers have their own clubs, they have their own housing like that, to create that distance. But similarly, if you simply think that God is the master, there can't be pure love because there'll be other motivations mixed in. Fear, or let's get something out of the master. What's he going to give us? What are the benefits the master is going to give? But in the Loka Vrindavan, the topmost portion of the spiritual world, no one relates to Krishna because they want something. They simply relate to Krishna with a desire to give Krishna happiness. That's all. So this is a brief summary of how comprehensive bhakti is and why Krishna says there's nothing superior. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Being in a position of spiritual leadership is a chance to be servant of the servant. You're always thinking about how to do that. And your consciousness becomes molded in that way. If you meditate on how to become a servant leader, then Krishna empowers you more and more how to render service to others, even though you're in a leading capacity. So if you always think that your leadership position is a chance to serve others, and you beg Krishna for his help in doing that, this is topmost yoga. Like Krishna telling Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita, Mama Nushma Yucha Cha, fight and think of me. How, do you, how can Arjuna fight in the battle of Kurukshetra and think of Krishna? Similarly, how can I be a leader and at the same time Think that I'm everyone's servant. Seems contradictory, doesn't it? But that is the power of bhakti. It resolves all those contradictions. Just like Arjuna can fight and think of Krishna. Similarly, a devotee can take up a leading capacity, leading role, and still think how to be everyone's servant. That is the great benefit of taking responsibility in Krishna's service. At first it seems impossible. And sometimes it's difficult because a leader has to draw the lines on dives. And come on, Prabhu, we're all Prabhus. Who are you? To <laughs> come on, come on, we're all Prabhus. <laughs> all right, just because you took up the bhakti process two months before me, now you're telling me what to do. <laughs> Yeah.
yes, it can taking up a leading role in Krishna conscious society can really make you bow down and beg for Krishna's mercy. <laughs> Ask anyone who's a GBC, they'll tell you that. <laughs> Prabhupada set up ISKCON so that the, there's not one individual who is in charge, it's the governing board. And the governing body commissioners are supposed to be the ultimate authority in their zones. But sometimes that's forgotten. <laughs> so then you have to try to gently and gradually bring about the right understanding, not because you want to be the big controller, but because that's Prabhupada's system. So it's tough. To, for yourself, you just want to walk away. Hey, do what you like, I don't care. <laughs> you know what I mean? But for the sake of service, you have to assert yourself, and it's tough. Maybe one day you'll find out. <laughs> for the sake of rendering service, sometimes you have to assert yourself. This is right. This is what should be done. Not be done. So yes, if you execute a position of spiritual responsibility with a desire to serve, not with selfish motivations, then Krishna will give you intelligence how to do it. Yes. Um, Maharaj. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Maharaj. Please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, I always thought that as we serve Krishna, that uh, then Krishna, Krishna reveals himself to us. But, um, yes, that's true. He says that in Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you talk about your day, comes to Taiva Pajamya. As you surrender to me, I am reciprocating with you. Yes. But, um, and I always thought that um, Krishna was reciprocal because if we... That Krishna was what? Well, Krishna is reciprocal. 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 Yes. Yes, so the thing is, it's like, as we're serving Krishna, because Krishna is being reciprocal, that means we're learning and we're growing and we're... Um, where our Kripa is growing because we're getting the reciprocation. But if we didn't get the reciprocation, then perhaps we wouldn't grow in that direction. But you see, there's more and more personal types of reciprocation. Just like the postie may come to your house and put the post in the box and you reciprocate if you see him by saying thank you or good day, right? Yeah. And that's reciprocation, right? But it's not the same kind of reciprocation you give to your family member, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's different intensities of reciprocation. Yeah. So Krishna will reciprocate with you according to the intensity that you deserve. You're not going to give the postie the same reciprocation that you give to a beloved family member. Still, you're going to reciprocate. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and, and see, that's the whole thing. It's like, um, it's like when they say a person has hunger for, for God, that means when Krishna is reciprocating, reciprocating that hunger is uh, fulfilled because we're receiving from Krishna by him reciprocating to us. So, so, um, yeah, I understand what you mean, the different form. There cannot be true hunger, as you say, for God, unless you know what is God. Real hunger depends on awareness of what you are hungry for. <laughs> so the more that you know what is Krishna, naturally the more you're going to be attracted. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, in this situation, it's like uh, when you're a child, your parents uh, are, are um, your Krishna.
because is there on? They go good. And so what is the question? Um, so like a child, a child actually doesn't know and may not know about the hunger, but the parents are in a higher position. So therefore the child is surrendering to the parents to, and so? to, to receive. So um, Gradually, the child grows up and realizes and what the parent is doing for the child. Gradually, and okay. appreciation. But that is a. But in the beginning, the child may not think that way. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But as the child gets older, the child appreciates what the parent is doing. Yes. So the more we understand Krishna, yes. the more. Show us. Maharaj. No, come on, come on, come on. Sure. <laughs> Can I hear? Maharaj, uh, on the road and sometimes uh, many places in the school, so we face a problem that I love my prophets. I love my prophets? Yes. Oh, you're a businessman. No, I'm not Maharaj, but uh, the, some sect of the community, they feel like that and they challenge us that we love our prophets and we're happy to die for our prophets. Profit, oh, not a profit, oh, profit. <laughs> not a profit. So it's just a, as a viewer, we always feel the pressure of our instigated saying that do you die for your profits? Do you what? Die. Do you die for your profits? Everyone's going to die. That's right. <laughs> Whether it's for the profit or not, you're going to die. <laughs> so what is your question? So the question is my that you know we face these sort of questions that would you die for your profit? And what should be answered? We are living for Krishna, and if we live for Krishna, it is certain that we will at the last moment of life we will think of Krishna. So we focus on living for Krishna. <laughs> Death will come no matter what, but not to worry. <laughs>
<laughs> as they say in the USA, debt comes as sure as taxes. <laughs> you have to pay your taxes. Uh, uh, you call that your what? Uh, GST, what else? Rates, and what else? Uh, is there any income tax? Oh, yes. Yeah, personal tax. Uh, as sure as that, there's that. <laughs> so we focus on living for Krishna, and then you can be sure that you will die in Krishna consciousness. Our program is not fanaticism. <laughs> you have to come inside. Yeah, so he's asking that we should focus on Krishna and even though Krishna has so many expansions and incarnations, uh, we focus on Krishna, but then we see on the altar that there are various forms of Krishna. But we understand Govindamadi Pusham, Dhamma We understand that Krishna is the source of even the avatars. And also, Lord Chaitanya is different. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is different. He's actually not an avatar. He's also avatari. He's also source of avatars. That's a very special former Krishna, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. As devotees, we appreciate Krishna in all his expansions. But at the same time, we know Swayam Bhagavan Krishna. Krishna is the original personality of God. Just like you appreciate your father in all his capacities, his work capacity, <laughs> his home capacity. So we appreciate Krishna in all his capacities. But we know what capacity Krishna likes us to focus on the most. Just like your father doesn't want you to focus on his work or business capacity. Even though he has it. Yes, you can acknowledge it. That's nice. But he wants you to focus on his relationship with you, his loving father and loving son. Okay. All right. I thank you all for your kind attention. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare Krishna